Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, where we get to chat with the icons of the event industry. My name is Audrey Gallian, and I'm going to be the host for today's session. So thank you again for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about all things transportation at events. And I'm going to tell you exactly what that means in a couple seconds. So let's go ahead and jump right in. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter. Submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. Welcome again to today's show. We're talking about transportation at events. Transportation is key to an event success, either creating or easing the stress for our participants, as we know. And from the time you enter an unfamiliar city, knowing how to get from point A to point B, or the very least knowing where to get to place to place is such an important part of the event experience, bottom line. And we could talk about incentive levels, right? Transportation can be a differentiator and it can be awful if it goes wrong. So mm -hmm. we are going to dive into every aspect of that storyline today and hopefully have you all walk away with some tidbits on how to make this process a smooth ride. Yes, pun intended. So today we're going to spend some time with two folks from event transportation systems who you obviously will, obviously will get to learn all about. So I want to introduce our, our two guests today. So first and foremost, we have Eric Hotard, who is a seasoned, experienced veteran of the transportation business, actually with over 35 years on just focusing on building, running a series of highly successful ground transportation, businesses that serve corporations, associations, nonprofits, all across North America. Eric is all about planning, man, and that sounds like a headache, so <laughs> we'll learn about that. Maybe this will be a, a, a therapy session too. Uh, but Eric really is all about planning and managing, overseeing the operations, the logistics, and it's all sizes, right? And whether we're looking specifically at conventions, it doesn't matter the size, he's done it. So um, this is growing enterprises of multi-million dollar businesses within ground transportation. So we're going to talk all about that. But Eric, hello, thanks for, for joining us today. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm good, I'm good. I'm happy, Great. happy to talk. And Same so, here. Oh, yes. And so our second panelist today is Lisa Lanny. Lana? Lana. Lana, thank you. Should I You're ask welcome. You? Uh, and Lisa is multifaceted, right? So she is all about developing and executing sponsorship strategy within the, the life of transportation, right? How do we ultimately save money at the end of the day? How do we leverage sponsors? And of course, managing a team, negotiating a contract, producing a video, building a website, writing a script, also skiing a black diamond. So we're going to talk about that too, uh, but always delivering thought on customer service. So between the two of our guests today, I think we're going to have a really awesome conversation. So thanks, Lisa, for joining us too. Thank you. Fantastic. So Quick reminder for those who are listening, we are having a conversation with you on Facebook, on Twitter, on chat roll, using that Q&A panel. This is about you. So if you have a question at any time, really take advantage. We will get to your question. We want this to be relevant for you. And it's a topic that we all face 
really every day, no matter what. So I'm really looking forward to talking about it. So if we just jump right in, we always like to ask a nice warm up question for you both. And I'll start with you, Eric, but wanting to know what got you into this industry? And if you weren't in the industry that you're in, what would you be doing? Uh, what I would be doing is a tricky question. I have no idea. I grew up in this industry. My mm. parents owned a very small bus company in New Orleans, mm. and it evolved into a um, company that provided transportation, um, sightseeing tours, travel management to groups that came in and out of New Orleans. So I've been in this business uh, my entire life. And you, uh, and you know, know nothing else. This is what you want. I, I know nothing else. <laughs> Whether it's what I want or not is totally irrelevant now. At my age. <laughs> but it's been a good life for me. Awesome. It's been fantastic. Yeah. And I'm sure your depth of knowledge mm -hmm. being grown up into it is a whole nother level. So yes, that's, that's awesome. Yes. I drove buses for uh, five or six years cross country. So I've driven a bus in just about every major city in North America. Wow. So that was a, uh, that was an incredible experience. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yes. Lisa, what about you? So what got you into this industry? And if you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? Well, my trajectory probably wasn't as straight as Eric's. Um, <laughs> I grew up in New York. I yep. moved here in the 90s to Washington, D.C. Uh, I got my first job at the Smithsonian where I... Um, Good first job. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I worked in the continuing education division mm. where I planned lots of lectures and special events. So that's kind of how I, I guess, started in getting into the events industry. Um, from there, I went to a, a few different associations and then a couple of startups, um, mostly in kind of smaller entrepreneurial settings. Um, then I met Eric at a networking event, actually, and uh, he had just bought Newsday Communications to kind of uh, integrate that as a division into his business, and he was looking for someone to manage that whole sponsorship side of the business. So I came on board and not only do I do that, but I picked up kind of the marketing efforts for both of our organizations, as well as rebranding and uh, handle marketing operations and sort of just kind of cheap, cheap cook and bottle washer. So awesome. uh, do a lot of different things. Awesome. And a lot of fun. So what, where did you two meet? What was the, what was the networking event? Oh, do you remember, Eric? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't remember. I really don't. It was, uh, it we, was definitely an industry, a, yeah. a, an events industry event, but I don't remember which one. And I think we both had mutual friends that yeah. knew that we were look, what we were looking for, and that's how we kind of got connected there. Exactly. Awesome. And then if I wasn't doing this, I would probably be traveling during the summers, and I would probably be ski instructing during the winters. Awesome. <laughs> that sounds like a, a solid retirement. So yeah, exactly. we'll get you there. <laughs> well, good, good. I, and I, I always like to ask because we so often underestimate how much networking influences our career, our path, where we go, and especially getting event planners to go to those events. Because mm -hmm. um, it's not just about learning what the industry is doing, but making those connections goes such a long way. Uh, but we're here to talk about transportation. So yes. let's, let's dive in. So Eric, I want to warm us up with another question of just thinking about what do you consider to be the core of a great transportation strategy in an event? Now, I know it completely varies at the type of event, the attendees, where it is, but if you had kind of the nuts and bolts to that, how would you describe it? Well, you first want to look at where you're bringing people from, where they're staying, um, how many we need to move, um, the venue that you're going to, is it conducive to having large groups coming in and out of it? Um, there's so many factors to it. Uh, the, the city, is the city conducive to, can you move freely when right. some cities you can't move because of gridlock, some cities it's easier to move. Um, so you have to look at it, a lot of different factors. Um, what activities are planned, social activities are planned mm. in that city. Um, so there's a 
probably 30 different factors that you really need to look at and planning it and execute to, to start executing a good plan for mm -hmm. your event. What, what detail do you see sometimes getting overlooked? So you have kind of the, your full, the critical questions that get asked. Are there any questions that you see often get skipped? Um, many planners, um, start talking to us after they selected their hotels and they s made all the selections mm -hmm. um, of the venues and their hotels without uh, coming to us before and getting our opinion on is this venue conducive easy ease of moving people in and out of right. um, is this hotel geographically desirable to other hotels that would make for a good shuttle route um, so sometimes they come to us too late and they already have contracted hotels and they added a huge cost to their uh, budget because this one hotel doesn't fit with the rest of the mm. um, hotels in the, in the shuttle route. Right. So Does that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think many people see it as a service that's reactionary to what you booked versus proactive and being part right. of the process in the beginning. Yes. Interesting. And have yes. you seen, have you seen a shift? And Lisa, I'd like to ask you, especially for you thinking about how you interact with key stakeholders and the sponsorship sponsorship side, how do you all align yourself to be part of those initial conversations and, and what that buy-in would look like? Well, on the planning side, we sign multi-year contracts with our customers mm -hmm. and we help them um, once we're on board, then we can look at their, uh, consult with them on their future cities or where are they going, what their hotel packages are going to be like. Um, several of our customers are doing that now. They finally understand. Right. With how important it is, and so they won't book a hotel without us uh, proving whether this is a good uh, fit or not. Mm. And so um, we, we're finally some people get it and some don't. So um, it's been a long time. It's taken a while to get it to that point, um, but once they understand and see the benefit of it, then they they jump on board right away. Right. Yeah incentive to to be on board with a long, longer contract too i'm sure so yes yes yeah that's great and the cost uh, i mean uh, coaches new coaches today are half a million dollars so the, you know the costs keep on going up and so it, it can be on a citywide meeting the transportation is normally the second or third largest one ticket item mm, amazing it is that's yes. incredible. Your your decorating a decorator, A V and then transportation uh depends on if you work. have a lot of F and B in a program, but transportation yeah. is third or fourth. Mm. So, so so Lisa, in regards to the sponsorship side of the story and kind of planning on a budget and being part of that conversation. How have you been able to bring some influence into the transportation conversation that from Eric, what it sounds like is really evolving so much. Yeah, exactly. I mean, with costs going up, you know, planners are always looking, looking at ways to um, reduce costs and that can be in the way they contract with Eric in terms of um, perhaps, you know, limiting, um, the amount of buses or how often they're running. Um, but on the other side, how to generate, how can they generate revenue off of uh, buses? So right. either through shuttle graphics um, or uh, we do a lot of um, sponsored video productions, which play on the buses. And it's a really um, compelling offering both for the organization in terms of generating revenue and also for the sponsor who gets really good exposure as those buses are, um, riding to and from the hotels. You know, at some of these convention centers like San Diego, for example, you walk outside, the buses are parked right there, the attendees cross the street over the railroad tracks, they go to lunch, they come back. A lot of the time the graphics are on both sides of the buses. I have some really cool photos like looking from the city side at the convention center and you see these giant, you know, graphics, you can't miss them. 
Mm. You know, so it's, it's a way to get, you know, attention from pretty much every attendee, you know, who's, who are seeing these. Um, and then with video playing on the buses as they're going around, I mean, that's a captive audience. You've got your audience on the bus and they're definitely going to see an ad that's playing on a video program and, you know, at some point pay attention to that. So that's a really um, compelling opportunity. Yeah. And have you seen the conversation and Eric for you too, but Lisa, I want to start with you of just a shift in the conversation with a company like yours and, and not realizing how much return on investment you can generate when, you know, it's, it is one of the biggest costs in, in the, the planning process, but actually investing in how much can we get out of this transportation yeah. system? Well, you know, it's, it really varies from client to client. Um, we don't necessarily have a lot of influence in terms of how they're pricing the opportunity. Um, we do in some cases. Um, we we actually do the sales in some cases. Um, so with one of our clients, we have more freedom to um, test, you know, maybe some higher pricing on certain opportunities or new opportunities that they haven't tried before. Um, but when we're providing the graphics or just providing the video and the client is doing the pricing, we don't really have that much influence over that. But, you know, I try to um, give some consulting advice in terms of what I think would work best, right. you know, um, whether, you know, some, some organizations will offer sponsorship by route, some will do by the bus, some will integrate it into like a gold, silver, or bronze package. Um, so it, you know, it kind of varies from client to client. And we can kind of see as we're, you know, working with their advertisers, you know, we see how much they're selling and we see which right. approaches are working best and which aren't. So we're able to kind of talk to our clients and say, oh, we've seen, you know, this approach really works best. One of our clients, um, we started working with them on sponsorship or I did about five years ago. We have more than quadrupled their revenue over four years, just by changing what we offer. You know, we, you know, definitely worked on pricing. We introduced new options. Um, so we've had a lot of success with some of our clients That's on, amazing. you know, strategy. That's so great. I mean, it, it's such a simple and feels like an obvious addition to this kind of service. Right. But traditionally, I'm sure, I mean, who knows? I, Eric, you, you're looking at 35 years of a lens. And what, one of the things I wanted to ask you, too, was if you've seen a shift in the expectation of the actual participant for what kind of experience they get through their transportation or the type of transportation that's offered, have you seen some shifts in that um, as of late? Um, the Uber app has um, given us some, ex raised the expectation a little bit. Mm. And so we've developed a, a shuttle app and we put a GPS device on the shuttle buses and our, and the attendees can now look at, uh, on the, um, we have a link to the show app and they can see where the bus is. So they can actually walk out of their hotel and say, Oh, the bus is five minutes away or 10 minutes away. Um, they can go in and get another cup of coffee or do whatever. And or they can wait in their room until they can see us two minutes away and come downstairs at the last minute. Right. Yeah. And that's so great from a weather perspective because, yes. you know, if it's raining outside, people don't want to walk outside and have to, you know, walk to the curb and wait for the bus and wonder when the next bus is coming. They know right. when it's coming and they can stay yeah. dry <laughs> until the bus shows up. Yeah. And that's taken us a long time to develop that because there's yeah. so many factors that <laughs> affect the transportation system. Mm. But anyway. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I think it's know, knowing where your car or your, your bus is and also just accessibility. Have you all seen a demand uh, for buses or shuttle services at a faster frequency? Um, or is there kind of a standard for how you, how you spread out the service? Um, <clears throat> we design shuttle bus systems to move the number of participants that are staying on that shuttle sure. route. Yeah. Um, so that's the first priority. 
and then a second priority would be frequency. And so um, some groups are using a longer window midday so they can save money. Um, mm. They'll take it from maybe 15 minutes to 20 minutes to 30 minutes. Uh, some groups are shutting down midday service. They're doing four hours in the morning and four hours in the afternoon um, and to save money. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the the most of the time, the window, the frequency window is dictated by how many people we need to move. Some shutter routes, we can run a frequency of 10 minutes uh, where another right. route has uh, 500 more people staying on it. And to move everyone, we have to run a three to five minute service. Right. That so, makes perfect sense. Yeah. It all depends, but the right. frequency. But most of the time when you're looking at it, we, people are planning for a 10 to 15 minute window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the most part. Totally reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to bring us to the perspective of the attendee and um, think about, well, actually we just talked about the attendee. So let's talk about the person who's actually purchasing this service. What should they be thinking about in regards to what transportation to offer? And I know there's, you know, 30 factors that you mentioned, but you know, what kind of budgeting should, should be, be kind of put together first. And I think you touched on it earlier, Eric, about the fact that it's kind of, okay, we booked everything. Now let's find our transportation. Um, but Lisa, I do want to ask you too, from, from the conversations from a creative perspective too, you know, what are some questions that uh, the folks who are planning should be thinking? Uh, Lisa, you want to go? Or you want me to go? You go first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> On, on the, for budgeting, um, that is, a, uh, I would start that process a lot earlier, um, a couple of years out, uh, you can, you can get a good number from your transportation provider, um, in advance. The, um, it really depends. It changes from city to city. <clears throat> Orlando, for for one thing, um, Orlando, people you rent a lot of cars in Orlando, so the number of people that you use the shuttle buses comes down a little bit. The percentage of people that use shuttle buses come down, uh, and to then you go to Chicago where hardly anyone rents a car because there's so many cabs and it's easy to get around by a, a private by a car, um, a hired car service. Uh, Uber, Lyft, or cab. So less people rent cars in Chicago. And uh, so you, you have to look at so many different factors yeah. for each city. And it, some city, like I said, some cities, we, we have to, use, we move more people on the same, a greater percentage of the people that are in the hotels. In some cities, we move less. And then you go into a city like San Diego, if the weather's fine, most of the people will walk, but as soon as it rains, then everybody's looking for a shuttle bus. And so looking at the weather patterns of the city, uh, same, same thing with San Francisco, people like to walk unless it's, it's raining or cold. So we have to take all those th factors into consideration. Um, the time of year, um, the, what's the rainy season for a location, um, the, uh, we look at how many people rent cars, how many people need to shuttle. So um, it's starting a, a year out is, is not too early. Mm -hmm. um, most groups want to have a budget number a year to a year and a half out. And so I would start a good year out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think that one thing that's interesting about that too, is that you all are providing that information of, who, you know, taking Orlando as an example, being an advisor of how much service they're going to need. I mean, that's something that is a, a big institutional knowledge to know in our industry. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And they're, they, they're, so we are giving a, a bid process. And so having that institutional knowledge uh, affects um, our numbers on how we, and how we bid. Exactly. 
And uh, so we, we do a post ridership report and I I think every customer should be getting a post ridership report Mm. um, because you know, how was the system design that you're buying and how did it perform compared to what it was designed to? If you don't know that, then you don't know, uh, you don't have any basis when you go to your next city. Mm. And so we measure everything. Uh, we measure how many people are on the buses, how long it's taken us. So when we go to what percentage of the room block is using the shuttle. Um, so when we go to the next city in the next year, we can really tweak it down to where we're getting strong. Uh, we're tightening up or do we need to add more buses? We need to take some back. Yeah. Uh, do we need to run faster or slower? So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad he mentioned the ridership report because I, I was going to bring that into the conversation because that plays into, um, you know, sponsorship opportunities. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's the way to show sponsors how many people exactly are riding the buses and seeing a video, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, before they're getting on the bus, they're seeing the exterior graphics or on the bus, they're seeing interior graphics that are on the windows um we offer those or seat headrest covers um so yeah i mean spot that this shift i would say that i've seen since uh when i first started working with eric is that ask for the data the um sponsors really want to see roi so they want numbers they want to know how many people are seeing their ads so that ridership report is really important um to you know making the sale yeah and I mean, that collection of data over time, that must just be so cool. I want to just sit down yeah. and read through what you have on a city and just that that's really fun knowledge to have. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it changes for every show mm-hmm. because show A has this shuttle has, are using these hotels and then show B, show B has a different group of hotels depending on the, um, cost of those hotels you know the the financial burden so some groups have to use a more economical package and some groups can use a more deluxe package so you, you can't say uh, the, this is the same for this city all the time right. it really depends on the group and so learning the group and learning each the, the travel patterns of each group is is very dynamic yeah oh i'm sure yeah yeah it's quite interesting. I know it might sound trivial, but it is quite interesting. <laughs> well, no, I think <laughs> For some I, geeks it is. <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm feeling passionate about this now, and I never thought to be honest. I didn't think I would, but I mean, it's yeah. there's so much detail into it. It's not just the service that gets provided, but yes. there's there's so many dif- different pieces of the puzzle and right. expertise that again, just knowing that that's out there and that's not up to the individual planner to come up with is, right. is really great. Um, I want to think about and talk about incentive programs. So Lisa, this is definitely for you. Uh, just favorite examples of what you've seen to incentivize folks to take the transportation. So, uh, yeah, and I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry to incentivize. So, so basically to, to um, you know, we say that transportation can elevate an incentive program to an attended, attended event, use the transportation, the different layers. And so we're wondering if you had an example of that, of where you've seen a really successful adoption of, of the transportation and, and why you saw that. Hmm. You talking about for an incentive program for a corporate incentive program? Yeah. Oh, um, um, yes. They a lot of corporate groups. It, I guess it, the transportation can be molded more to the outing that they're going on. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, we can get into um, some exotic vehicles we have some vehicles now that have a uh the roof can come can slide open Mm. on some mini on some uh unique small smaller vehicles and so we can customize we can do stuff like that on a on a corporate stuff on a corporate meeting right trolleys trolleys uh um 
if you're going on a safari or something like that, then you can kind of, um, on, in a city, in a downtown environment, it's hard to, to do that. But an incentive program, um, it's, you know, depending on what the can, what the incentive group would like to do, you can <laughs> right. use what a is the incentive? Yeah. <laughs> an <laughs> elephant to a camel, you know, so it's, it's, uh, uh, uh pedicabs, uh, they start to use those, uh, now at conventions sometimes mm. they'll sponsor pedicabs, uh, and a, a corporate group will sponsor a pedicab for mm. the day and let people ride it to and from the convention center so yeah there was one group i i read about uh, one sponsorship where um those uh like elect electric carts were on the trade show floor and so a sponsor was able to put their salespeople driving around on the electric carts and you know picking people up and driving around and giving their sales pitch <laughs> while they're driving them around on the trade show floor so that was kind of creative <laughs> What is the wildest transportation that you've offered? Hmm. <laughs> wow. Wow. And it can't be a segue. Yeah. No. The, the, you, you have to be somewhat um, re, uh, a little more reserved because That's fair. of the liability aspect of right. it. Right. The whole safety thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so... Um, the wildest, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, probably the, the pedicabs. Yeah. We, we've, we've done golf carts on mm -hmm. the trade show floors, but probably the pedicabs. Um, that's, you, you really, as a sponsor, if something happened and you sponsored it, then the company, the sponsor, can also be liable so you're not going to get into hang gliding and or <laughs> stuff like that you know, because if something happened you know and then they're responsible they're yeah or hot air ballooning yeah <laughs> i mean you you'll do that on a on a on a um on a an incentive program incentive trip and you have all the disclaimers but on a you know on a program where you have a citywide convention it's hard to offer those types of things. Yeah. Unless it's a, a chosen, they choose to do something like that through an, uh, a spouse or guest program. Mm. Okay. And Lisa, have you ever gotten an outlandish kind of, we really want this to happen and we're going to sponsor it. Can you do it situation or is, no, or is no, not really, not really. Okay. Not really. I mean, yeah. one of our clients is always pushing us to come up with some other type of yeah, transportation related or outside the convention center. You know, they, a lot of the times they have, you know, these, these organizations will hire third party groups to manage different parts of the sponsorship. So sometimes we're only allowed to handle certain things you know and so you know they're always just they are pushing the envelope but they haven't come up with anything too crazy that you know that we haven't been able to do that's so, great yeah. that's great well so i know that we've seen a big push in the green movement going paperless cutting down emissions all that good stuff so has that been a conversation when you talk to uh potential sponsors to lisa is just how do we make this as green as possible? Not really. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, you know, the material is the material that you have to use to put on the buses. And yes, unfortunately, we do have to throw that away afterward. There's not yeah. really any way to, to make that greener. Um, but but using... on, on Eric's side, in terms of um, being green, you know, I think they ask... They, they do ask a lot of questions about transportation and the vehicles. Mm. But using, using motor coaches for transportation is the most efficient way to go. Most of the vehicles uh, average around 10 mile, uh, eight miles to the gallon, 10 miles to the gallon. So you move in 50 to 55 people. Um, you take in 10 to 10 to 15 cars off the street. Right. for every bus so that is the greenest mode of transportation even if you see a little black so that is still the greenest right. transportation there is got the most bodies in there yeah yes that makes exactly sense. right it is the 
when you break it down per gallon per mile, it is the most efficient way to move people. Awesome. So you're green. You're done. Yes, we, we are green. Yes. <laughs> yes. Even though I have a blue shirt on, I am. Green. <laughs> <laughs> Love anyway. It. So let's talk about the ride share. I know you mentioned Uber impacting that. Now you, you have that um, GPS mm. integrated, but have you seen more folks opt into their own transportation because it is more easily accessible or are they more likely to take what's provided as it's just simply part of the event experience? Has that impacted your business at all? Um, I don't think it has. Uh, I think younger people are more um, um, willing to just hop in a car uh, with an Uber driver without having, I don't want to say proper credentials, but I know um, Uber really has changed the per capita, per capita car ride service. Um, before you had a lot of regulations by states and cities and so you had certain parameters that you had to stay within and now per, Uber has kind of changed that. So on the per capita side of the business, it has changed a lot. Hmm. Um, it's hurt, really hurt taxi cabs, uh, sedan car companies. Although the sedan car companies are starting to see a resurgence of their business coming back. Oh, interesting. Because of the professionalism of the driver. Hmm. The driver's in coat and tie. They have a clean car. Where an Uber driver, you don't always know what you're getting. Right. And so you have a lot of the, the, the liability issues. So you are cert there, there was a, a lull there for a little while where Uber was hurting the professional limousine companies, but now you're starting to see a comeback for them. Mm. So, and are, are you all seeing um, with that just, you know, kind of putting different people in different services or different vehicles. So having exclusive executive sedan service for, uh, VIP population, or is it is it more kind of shared service generally? Um, when we are providing VIP service, it's pretty much for one person. Mm -hmm. One of our groups will provide um, sedan service or SUV airport transportation for their top exhibitors. And sometimes we'll share if their flights are, are coming in at the same time, they'll share that car. Um, but for the most, most of the time, those groups, those individuals don't want to wait for another flight or right. you can't, you can't have, if you set up one car and one flight's delayed and a half an hour, then someone here, um, it, it's just too cumbersome to try and have somebody waiting for somebody else. Mm. So they will still schedule different cars. Okay. Unless they're on the same flight. If they're on the same flight, obviously, then we can put them in the same car. But mm -hmm. if it's uh, if they're two different flights, 10 or 15 minutes away, and today's schedule, someone's always late. Yeah, yeah that's just true. That's and, just true. Um, and for uh, um, companies that are sponsoring, like IBM or some corporation that's having their own meeting, they will um, will use buses mm -hmm. uh, when we can. And then we'll use minibuses or, or sedans or SUVs. Um, they want to use, uh, provide airport transportation because it controls their cost. They know for sure right. what their cost are fixed for the most part. Right. And I get hit at the end with a lot of uh, taxis or, or Ubers or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they, they are very adamant about providing airport transportation for their attendees. We're an association... Sense. You know, they're not overly concerned about how somebody get comes in or not. Some people might rent a car and stay for a long weekend and go driving around afterwards. So it's too hard to try and pr provide that for that for that type of group. Hmm. So I want to I want to take us to some basic questions for folks who may be thinking about again having these conversations for the first time knowing that you need transportation and just trying to figure out okay if we know that there's transportation already set up by the hotel shuttle is it worth our time to provide a shuttle at that is sponsored 
you know, Lisa, for your lens of, is it worth the visibility? And I'm sure it all comes back to someone's budget, but if there are kind of the basic transportation needs that you should offer, kind of the fundamentals, what do you see as those kind of first steps? Well, they, sometimes your hotel shuttles will work, but you have to look at how many people you need to move and right. the time mm -hmm. frame that you need to move them in. Uh, a lot of these hotel shuttles will provide an airport transfer or a shuttle to uh, a convention center once every 15 minutes or 20 minutes. They only have one vehicle, and it's okay for moving ones and twos or threes and fours, but if you got to move 100 to 150 people and they only have one vehicle, so you really have to understand your circumstance. Yeah, that's fair. Absolutely. Yeah. So have you seen kind of your positioning in the market change over the past five years with, of course, you know, the Ubers of the world helping influence the technology that you use, but it sounds to me that you've also have turned into a service that is really advisory and provide, you know, providing nice advices. This is the city you're booking in and here's what we know. Um, is that an expectation now? Is that overtly advertised? I, I would love to know how you've evolved as an organization. Well, we, we do advise. We're similar to an architect, a contractor, and, and, a, and a builder because we design the system that you need. Mm -hmm. And then we provide, we contract the vehicles, whether it's a coach, a minibus, a sedan, and then we provide on-site management. Uh, right. So it's a one-stop shop, but we all are, we're all of those things built into one. Right. And so some people have used this as an advisory capacity to, if they want to check their other vendor, if they're in the contract and they want to check their other vendor, we have, we have done some consulting work. Okay. Just plain straight consulting work. <laughs> yes. So obviously we don't, uh, this is where we prefer to be is we want to do everything, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And Lisa, have you seen shifts in kind of what people are asking for with their sponsorship? And, you know, if people are thinking about kind of the fundamentals of what um, activations or different, you know, pillows or whatever you have, what are those kind of go-to asks that you get? Um, yeah, I don't think that's changed too much um, f in terms of the graphics that hasn't changed too much. Mm -hmm. um, we offer, you know, a variety of different size graphics um, that can be packaged together differently. Um, sometimes people will, you know, buy a graphic that covers the whole side of the bus and the back of the bus or the full bus or just a, a, a banner. Um, I think when you get into shifts it's probably video content the type of content that's being offered um, or being shown um, you know video is so popular now and is really being integrated in the full marketing strategy for many organizations um, so um, actually makes it easier for us to um, reach out to the organization that we, we do both. Like we'll produce a, a full video production with a team either before the show or on site, but we can also do a simple um, stitching together of existing content. So a lot of organiz a lot more organizations now have really good video content. So that's where I'm seeing a difference mm -hmm. in um, just making it easier to produce something. You know, I'd say that's where a lot of organizations they're probably not doing the video offerings as much as the graphics, mm -hmm. but it's so easy to do that because you can take that video content that you have and grab bits and pieces of that. You can just make simple slides that are reminders mm. for um, attendees to, you know, sign up for the fun run or visit the, you know, advocacy booth and find out what's going on or, you know, join it, you know, go to this booth and join a committee. And so you can stitch together a real simple program and sell that as a sponsorship opportunity. And mm -hmm. that's where I'm seeing a lot more interest now in terms of putting that type of program together that plays on the bus. It's yeah, just it's kind it, of it's kind of more of a static ad 
and it's and it, some of them don't want the audio and so it's just images that are scrolling you know on the video right and so uh but but it's also taking existing content from the association yeah, which which yeah. these days they have a lot more of so they can grab a video that they've produced already and give it to us and right. we can uh, edit that together with as eric said more static slides um there are lots of fun things that uh, organizations can do like um, with man on the street videos. I saw some, <laughs> you know, a really fun video where actually it's a, a producer that I've worked with before and he has a great video where he went out on the street at a, I think it was a travel industry so, you know, convention and he asked just random people on the street what the definition of a particular word was. It was, I don't know if it was like disintermediation or something, you know, and so people just came up with, you know, I don't know, and they'd come <laughs> up with really funny answers. And then it would end with like a board member or an important stakeholder giving the actual definition of that <laughs> word. I mean, there's so much fun stuff you can do with video. 100%. So yeah. yeah, so that's where I've seen a, a lot of a lot of shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you do you all are you thinking about 10 years from now, the future of what the asks are going to be for transportation? Are we seeing more and more about an experience, even if it's a 10 minute ride? Is it sticking to fundamentals? What do you kind of see as, if you were to predict the future, Eric, what would you say? Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on, on, the, on the incentive side, you can, you would have, you can raise the expectations I see on a citywide convention where you just gone from point A to point B, um, stick to the fundamentals. Um, cause people just want to, when that exhibit hall closes, people want to sit down. They want to get off their right. feet. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You want to go back to the hotel <laughs> and have a cocktail or dinner or whatever. And so I, I don't see it changing too drastically. Um, it's, it's a commodity service that as a group's need, and if right. it's done badly, it can be devastating. And if it's done properly, it can be very rewarding. Um, most people do not, um, they let you know when it's going bad and, uh, you know, but we do get a lot of praises on, on good transportation. Right. So many people go to different meetings. Um, we get a lot of compliments on, on shuttle bus systems and, and if, they can see how well it's organized and if it's running smoothly or not. Right. At the end of the day, it's about the execution, not it really is. whether or not you have waterbed chairs. And right. <laughs> right. And, you know, things happen. Uh, we, we, we had a building that caught on fire during a show and, and it shut down the street and how well you react to those things um, is transparent to the people, you know? Right. And so, things happen all the time. And so you have to be able to uh, adjust and, and move with, and go with the flow. Right. Yeah. And emergency and planning is probably a huge very, element. Very much so. And, and that's also key in the company that you're hiring is how well do they know the city? How well can they make adjustments on the, on the fly if need to be? You're paying us to develop a new, a, a strong plan um, but w you're also paying us to have a strong ex uh, adjustment to that plan right. if something does come about that needs to be changed. Right. How often do you see changes in the plan? Is that is that to be expected throughout the course of a single service you're providing? Um, it, it depends on what's going on in the city. Um, uh, we had a convention in, in a city and there was a, uh, a, uh, student festival going on. And so the city streets, we had no idea what, what where people were going to show up. And so we would have to call the local police department and say, okay, we're having trouble at this intersection with buses coming through. Mm. And so it just, it, that doesn't happen very often, but it does yeah. happen enough to where, you got to stay on top of it right? Yeah. <laughs> and working with the local city officials and knowing what, what to, what to anticipate. Um, one city has a fun run every year and it goes, it runs right in front of the convention center 
and it shuts down the shuttle bus system for three or four hours while it's going by. And just executing that, communicating it with the, to the attendees, letting everybody know what's going to, what the plan is. Right. Uh, that avoids a lot of problems. Um, changes on the, on the fly. Um, every now and then we have a, a gas me, I mean, a water main will break, uh, and the street gets shut down or a fire or accident. Mm-hmm. You know, with our with our GPS system, we can we can push out now to the attendees that the transportation the shuttle stop has changed because of this, and so it'll, we can push that. We have that uh, technology now to push out those last minute changes to the attendees. So that's mm. making it a lot easier to right. do that. Right. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. So, Lisa, I want to make sure I'm asking you the future question. <laughs> so, if you were to think about the future of sponsorship for event transportation, what do you think? I don't know if it's going to change too much. Um, yeah. If I had a wish, and I don't know if maybe I should mention this because maybe someone else will run with this idea, but <laughs> figuring out how to live stream to the video monitors on the buses oh, that would be really I cool. love that <laughs> yeah. that would definitely be good because then whatever's going on you know in the convention center could be live streamed onto the buses and that would be pretty neat well with the 5g technology that might yeah. not be that far off a yeah. lot of buses now have um a wi-fi system yeah so it's not consistent enough throughout the whole system the whole across North America to promote that. But a lot of buses do have a, a, a its own Wi-Fi system. That's great. You know? Yeah. So yeah. And m- maybe another five years, we might be able to do something like that. That might be our next project. Yes. <laughs> yes. Stay tuned, everyone. Right. Right. <laughs> have you exactly. seen uh, companies or sponsors want to do kind of mini sessions during the course of a 10 or 15 minute drive with, objectives or is it really just focused on getting from point a to point b um no i haven't really seen that but you know there could be some opportunity for something more interactive going on on the buses you know maybe that would work in the morning with people going to the convention center i'm just not so sure about the trip home when people are (laughs) Kind of done with their day, and they just want <laughs> quiet. This is what I'm hearing. Be you left just alone. Want yeah, so and yeah, take but that could be out. a possibility. I I thought about some some opportunities for that. Maybe having a comedian or some sort of yeah sponsored interactive session on the bus. Yeah, so maybe we'll that, test that sometime. That, that could happen more um, on an airport transfer, right? If we have or a sponsored a, airport transfer. Yeah. Or going to a special event. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so. you could you could put little mini foot massage jacuzzis under every chair. <laughs> That's a really good idea. I like it. <laughs> I don't know. I think that would be a little messy, but yes, <laughs> We're just throwing so. out throwing out the future. Yes, there, there you go. go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm conscious of our time together, and if anyone who's tuning in live, do make sure to get your questions in. Um, And I think we've covered such great ground. I mean, I I just, I selfishly, this has been so interesting to learn about. I think a piece of a puzzle that all too often we just take for granted, you know, okay, I'm going to hop in a shuttle bus, (laughs) you know, but there's so much detail that goes into it. Um, And it's just, it's really, truly, it's fascinating. Uh, Just for fun, Eric, want to put you on the spot. What city is the most complicated to navigate? <laughs> the most difficult to navigate? Yeah. Boston. Yeah. Boston. <laughs> yes. Those tunnels? Uh, just the narrow streets. The, oh, okay. Yes. Um, the easiest to get around, I would say, would be San Diego. Mm. But the, and, the, and the most difficult is Boston. Mm. Chicago and Boston are two cities. Um, where the convention center is far away. So mm. right now they, uh, they do have the cost of operating a shuttle bus system in Chicago is very similar to Boston. If you are same size group to same size group, 
you know, from one city, from one year to another, the same group, uh, it would be similar the cost wise. Mm. You know, I could have sworn you're going to say San Francisco, but I, you know, going in those steep hills, if that's something that adds a factor or not. Well, we don't, um, just when we go up Knob Hill, which is the only time we affect, uh, get, uh, have that opportunity, but yeah. for the most part, we stay out of those deep sides. Okay, good. <laughs> I guess that's part of the strategy, right? Right, right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so we, we, at the end of our sessions, we always like to make sure we get to two main questions. And the first is, if you had any piece of advice, your kind of golden gem of advice, thinking about our event planner listeners, what would you say? I would say um, speak to your consult your tr- shuttle management company as soon as you when you first start going to look at a city and right away can, yes communicate with them um, right away the the convention service people or the sales people at in, for the city of San Francisco they don't always understand the hotel packages I don't want to speak Chicago or Boston would be a better example where one hotel might be three blocks away, but you just can't get to it by a bus. Mm. And so it's so important to understand um, the flow of these hotels. And sometimes the hotels are recommended by the city just because they are a member of the bureau. Right. And so it doesn't mean whether it doesn't, uh, taking into consideration whether they're a good fit for a job or not. Mm. So get with your consultant earlier and, and get those ridership reports post. So you know what you're doing the next year. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Lisa, what do you think in regards to the sponsorship from <laughs> ever? I guess I would just, gym? I would just say if you're, if you're not using your shuttles as a sponsorship opportunity, you should be. Yes. <laughs> awesome yeah we have we have one group this year that we've been working with about eight years now and we're almost going to give them a free shuttle mm-hmm. the, the actual cost of the shuttle will be covered by the sponsorship that's amazing generation the revenues generated from the sponsorship yes and you're and you're able to to provide that information up front or how does that conversation look? I mean, that must be an awesome surprise for them. Well, we don't know what the sales are going to be like, right. you know, but yeah. so, um, but we, we have from working with them for years, we kind of have a track record of knowing what it's going to be like. Right. The cost of that shuttle changes from city to city. Mm-hmm. Um, so this next year will they'll almost get a free shuttle. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's very exciting to see. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really cool shift. Yeah. So yeah. for you both, any new cool, interesting resources that is kind of your go-to, it could be industry knowledge. It could be outside books, gadgets, apps, anything that is just really floating your boat right now. Well, I'm going to take the opportunity to promote our resources. We have a couple on, on our website. We have an, an RFP template that meeting planners can use awesome. to send out when they're looking for a transportation provider. And we also have a sponsorship checklist. So mm-hmm. I would recommend taking a look at both of those. Awesome. Eric, what about you? Our, our GPS system is, uh, it, it tracks riders. It tracks uh, the number, number of people getting on at each stop um it's uh the the attendee app that goes along with it it's very in-depth in-depth tool and it's uh, proving to be uh very very uh beneficial for the customer and for us the attend for all of all everyone the attendee the organizer and us in man- in becoming more efficient in managing our system yeah, and this is now just the standard. That's yes. awesome. It's yeah, just, that, it's so it cool. will become the standard, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so the lesson of today is to go on <laughs> your website and get all of the resources that are available 
and think about how you can make this transportation of events something that is not just a service that you provide, but an actual opportunity, right? Yes. I mean, at the end of the day. Awesome. Well, we are right about at the hour. So I want to say a huge thank you to you both for taking time to be on the virtual platform with us and talking about something that, well, frankly, I just don't think we talk about enough. So thank you both. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. you very much for the opportunity. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes. Thank and thank you. you to everyone who listened in today. Just a reminder that these are recorded live every single Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And you can watch the behind the scenes on Facebook Live, see us kind of chatting with each other up front. And every following Tuesday, this is released on iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, whatever you use that's your favorite podcast app, we are probably on it. And of course, you can go to event-icons.com to get the show notes, links to the resources that Lisa and Eric shared today. And the best way to sign up is also at events-icons.com. Make sure that you're on board with our weekly conversations. And of course, we want to know what you think. Use the Twitter hashtag event icons or join the Event Icons Facebook page. We do this for you, so we want to know what you think. And we want to know if you have some icons in mind, bring them onto the show. This is a community of folks who love what they do, and it's all about connection. And don't forget, we will be broadcasting live at IMAX America on October 17th. So we hope to see you there either live or on the virtual platform. So thank you again for joining us, and we will see you next week on Event Icons. Take care. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation. Sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on Hashtag Event Icons.